Hallo und herzlich willkommen äh, zur heutigen Veranstaltung, wo ähm, Bob Jessop leider nicht persönlich anwesend sein kann, aber da überlebensgroß an der Wand äh, angestrahlt ist. Ähm, wir freuen uns sehr, dass Bob sich die Zeit nehmen kann. Leider ist er aufgrund von einem Unfall nicht so reisefähig und deswegen heute nicht hier, aber fährt am Computer mit äh, frischem Kopf für uns da. Und er wird heute einen Vortrag halten ähm, mit dem Titel Reading Marx for Insights into the 21st Century Capitalism. Der Vortrag von Bob Jessop findet im Zuge einer Veranstaltungsreihe statt, ähm, einer Vortragsreihe anlässlich des 200. Jubiläumsjahr rund um Karl Marx ähm, und trägt auch selber den Titel Karl Marx im 21. Jahrhundert. Die Veranstaltungsreihe wird in einer Kooperation vom Wissensturm in Person am Katja Fischer, ähm, dem Institut für angewandte Entwicklungspolitik, hier Harald Wildfeldner als Hauptverantwortlicher und der Abteilung für Gesellschaftspolitik und Sozialanalysen am Institut für Soziologie der Johannes Kepler Universität, hier namentlich Brigitte Auenbacher, Roland Atzmüller und mir Fabienne Dessieu, ähm, veranstaltet. Ähm, die, das Marx-Jubiläumsjahr hat neben dieser Vortragsreihe, wo heute der letzte Termin in der Volkshochschule stattfindet, aber noch ein weiterer Vortrag an der Johannes Kepler Universität, ein öffentlicher, stattfinden wird, mit Thomas Sablowski zum Thema Entwicklungstendenzen und Krisen des Kapitalismus nach Marx. Neben dem finden noch weitere Veranstaltungen statt. Wir hatten jetzt vor zwei Wochen ein großes Marx-Jubiläumsfest, eine Geburtstagsfeier. Des Weiteren gibt es noch Exkursionen. Es gibt ein reichhaltiges Programm, was man auch unten in der Volkshochschule ausliegen sieht. Und ähm, neben den Ox Exkursionen, die noch kommen und dem Vortrag am 20. Juni in der Johannes-Kepler-Uni, äh, findet dann ab November die Fortsetzung der Vortragsreihe statt wo wir uns auch freuen, weiters internationale Expertinnen im Feld von Karl Marx begrüßen zu dürfen, unter anderem aus Südafrika mit Michelle Williams und Vishwas Satka, aber halt eben auch aus dem benachbarten Ausland mit jemandem wie Frigga Haug als große Expertin oder aus Wien angereist Stefanie Wöhl, die eine Buchpräsentation zum Thema Marxismus und Feminismus vornehmen wird, aber auch Alexandra, Alexander Dimirovic, der sich mit den Fragen der Demokratie und Ähnlichem rund um Marx auseinandersetzen wird. Also das heißt, wir sind zwar heute in der letzten Veranstaltung der Reihe vom Frühjahr hier im Wissensturm, aber es geht weiter und wir freuen uns dann auch schon auf weitere interessante Debatten. Ähm, noch eine weitere Werbeschaltung. Ähm, diejenigen, die heute nicht zum ersten Mal da sind, wissen ja, die Ausstellung war ja auch bereits über längere Zeit unten beheimatet in den Eingangshallen des Wissensturms. Wir haben aus der Ausstellung eine kleine Broschüre ähm, erstellt, wo Informationen und ein leichter Einstieg rund um Karl Marx, sein Leben und sein Werk und auch eine Aktualisierung und deren Bedeutung ähm, gegeben wird. Und diese Broschüre ist für einen Druckkostenbeitrag von zwei Euro da vorne erhältlich. Gut, jetzt aber äh, zu dem Punkt, warum wir heute hier sind, nämlich Bob Jessop und ähm, seine Perspektiven und seine Analyse mit Marx. Ähm, da Bob nicht anwesend sein kann, wird als erstes kurz der Kollege Roland Atzmüller einen kurzen Input geben, bevor Bob selber quasi mit seiner Lecture und seinem Vortrag anfängt. Ähm, ich stelle jetzt auch nach Rednerinnenreihenfolge vor und sage noch kurz was zu den Referenten. Ähm, Roland Atzmüller ist assoziierter Universitätsprofessor, ähm, wie gesagt, hier an der Johannes Kepler Universität am Institut für Soziologie in der Abteilung für Gesellschaftstheorie und Sozialanalysen. Ähm, seine Arbeitsschwerpunkte sind Kapitalismus und Gesellschaftstheorien, Wohlfahrtsstaatentheorien, Sozial- und Arbeitsmarktpolitik. Staatstheorien und Berufsbildungsforschung, Arbeitsforschung und soziale Ungleichheit. Ronald Atzmüller hat seine Habilitationsschrift unter dem Titel Krise und Veränderung der Reproduktion des Arbeitsvermögen, Elemente einer kritischen Theorie sozialer Investitionen und humal kapitalorientierter Sozialpolitik im vergangenen Jahr mittlerweile, <lacht> abgegeben, aber noch ganz frisch. Eine weitere aktuelle Publikation ist gemeinsam mit Alban Knecht von der Ausbildungsgarantie zur Ausbildungspflicht, die Entwicklung der österreichischen Beschäftigungspolitik für Jugendliche, die 2017 ebenfalls erschienen ist. Und er schreibt weiter an ganz vielen Artikeln, aber ich möchte jetzt hier auch nicht überfrachten mit Informationen zu Publikationen. Man findet 
Rolands äh, Schriften, auch wenn man ihn googelt auf unserer Homepage, problemlos und kann dort nachlesen, falls Interesse geweckt wurde. Bob Jessop ähm, ist Distinguished Professor der Soziologie und Co-Direktor des Forschungszentrums für Cultural Political Economy an der Lancaster Universität in Großbritannien im Vereinigten Königreich. Er ist bekannt für seinen Beitrag und seine Beiträge zur Staatstheorie, den Critical Governance Studies, der kritischen politischen Ökonomie und der kulturellen politischen Ökonomie, also Cultural Political Economy. Seine zwei zuletzt veröffentlichten Bücher sind Towards a Cultural Political Economy, Putting Culture in its Place in Political Economy. Dieses hat er gemeinsam mit Neiling Sum veröffentlicht 2013. Das zweite Buch ist The State Past, Present, Future, was 2015 erschienen ist. Bob Jessop ist sehr umtriebig und eine kleine Sammlung seiner Aufsätze ähm, ist 2007 auch in Deutsch erschienen in einem Sammelband unter dem Titel Kapitalismus, Regulation und Staat, ausgewählte Aufsätze. Außerdem, wer nicht so gerne Englisch liest, hat der Bob noch weitere Artikel in verschiedensten Fachzeitschriften, aber auch Sammelbänden und Editionen in Deutsch veröffentlicht. Ich sage immer, ich bin fast frustriert so viel, wie Bob Jessop schreibt, weil ich kann gar nicht so schnell denken, wie er Texte produziert, die sehr schlau sind. Also es lohnt sich auch da definitiv einen Blick nochmal nachzulesen, weil man sehr, sehr große Einsichten gewinnen kann in seinen Schriften. Und man sollte immer auf dem Laufenden bleiben, weil sonst verpasst man auch ganz viele schlaue Gedanken, weil es so schnell geht. Ich weiß es nicht genau, wie er das schafft. Um das zu tun, kann man ähm, bei ResearchGate ihm folgen und bei Academia EDU, weil da befüllt er das auch immer so, dass man einen freien Zugriff darauf hat, was natürlich auch sehr praktisch ist, wenn man der Arbeit folgen möchte. Bob arbeitet aktuell an einem Buch zum Thema Civil Society as a Mode of Governance between Self-Emancipation and Self-Responsibilization, was mit Sicherheit auch nochmal sehr spannende Einblicke bieten wird. Und jetzt würde ich an Roland übergeben und wir beschäftigen uns, wie gesagt, mit Reading Marx for Insights into the 21st Century. Ähm, danke Fabienne für die Anleitung. Vielleicht zwei Dinge zur Erläuterung. Also Bob wird auf Englisch referieren. Wir haben aber die PowerPoint-Präsentation, die er vorbereitet hat, hier sozusagen äh, dann die Möglichkeit, nach meiner kurzen Einführung äh, zu also Ihnen auch zu präsentieren, damit Sie mitlesen können. Bob versteht aber sehr gut Deutsch, sodass Sie die Fragen dann auf Deutsch auch stellen können. Wir können dann, wenn es notwendig wäre, zu übersetzen, äh, das auch übersetzen, sodass wir, denke ich, schon eine gute Diskussion zustande bringen. Ähm, mein Punkt, und das ist jetzt wirklich nur gedacht, das ist eine kurze Einführung, die auch einige andere der Vorträge, die wir gehört haben, weder dem von Klaus Dörre durchaus in diese Fragestellungen mit einbettet, ist, dass sozusagen die marxistischen Debatten sich so ab den 70er und 80er Jahren mit einem bestimmten Problem sozusagen, und Bob wird dann ja sozusagen die jüngsten Überlegungen und Analysen und Forschungen, die sich in dem Kontext ergeben, dann präsentieren, äh, konfrontiert war. Und dieses Problem war sozusagen, dass ab den 70er und 80er, das ist auch ein Thema in anderen Sozialwissenschaften, man von einem, einer massiven Veränderung kapitalistischer Gesellschaften ausgehen kann. Einerseits gab es vorher 1968, es gab das Auftreten neuer sozialer Bewegungen, auch gewerkschaftliche Kämpfe in den 70er Jahren, die Durchsetzung reformorientierter Regierungen, das Wachstum linker Parteien und das stößt alles an Grenzen in dieser Phase, an institutionelle, ökonomische Grenzen und Schwierigkeiten und Widersprüche, die natürlich auch mit der ökonomischen Entwicklung, aber auch mit der politisch-ideologischen Entwicklung zu tun haben, die sich in dieser Zeit beginnt abzuzeichnen. Und hier sozusagen ist dann der zweite Punkt, der wichtig ist, also von diesen Problemen, mit denen kritische linke Bewegungen und Parteien konfrontiert waren, die Regierungsübernahme durch neoliberale und neokonservativ orientierte Parteien und Bewegungen, gern wird ja Chile, der Putsch, der Pinochet an die Macht gebracht hat, wo dann Vertreter der sogenannten Chicago Boys dann auch die Wirtschaftspolitik in der Folge gemacht haben, als Beginn quasi genannt aber dann natürlich auch die Entwicklungen in Großbritannien mit Margaret Thatcher ab Ende der 70er Jahre, USA mit Reagan, Deutschland mit Kohl und so weiter. Also in die politischen Entwicklungen eingebettet ist das Ganze mit einem Ende des Nachkriegsbooms, des Aufschwungs der Wirtschaft nach 1945, dem Wiederauftreten von Arbeitslosigkeit, der beginnenden Finanzkrise des Staates, Internationalisierung und so weiter und auch dem Auftreten verschiedener gesellschaftlicher Veränderungen, Bildungsexpansion, 
die Familienstrukturen haben, verändern sich, Geschlechterverhältnisse sozusagen sind massiven Veränderungen ausgesetzt, aber auch Erscheinungen wie Migration oder ökologische Probleme. Für die marxistische Theorie ist das insofern interessant und ein Problem, weil sichtbar wird, dass Kapitalismus sich nicht linear entwickelt, sondern in unterschiedlichen Phasen. Das ist an sich nichts Neues für die marxistische, marxistischen Debatten. Das war sozusagen schon immer wieder das Thema Übergang vom liberalen Kapitalismus zum organisierten oder Monopolkapitalismus. Es gab aber in manchen Debatten eine bestimmte Tendenz anzunehmen, dass sozusagen diese Entwicklung irgendwann quasi in so einer Krisen, Dauerkrise, Endphase geraten müsste, was in Begriffen wie Spätkapitalismus in gewisser Weise angelegt ist, oder auch Monopolkapitalismus, also was kommt nach der Monopolisierung. Und deswegen ging man dann irgendwann der Frage nach, inwiefern man ab den 70er, 80er Jahren davon ausgehen kann, dass der Kapitalismus eine große Krise der, und der Transformation äh, eintritt, die mit eben dann äh, sozialen Kämpfen zur Überwindung dieser Krisentendenzen äh, verbunden ist. Verbunden ist es auch mit einer Änderung der Akkumulation, also der ökonomischen Prozesse und der Produktionsverhältnisse, Beginn der Bedeutung, der wachsenden Bedeutung des Finanzsektors, Internationalisierung und so weiter. Im Kontext der Durchsetzung neoliberaler und neokonservativer Regierungen gerät hier auch der Staat ins Visier der Veränderung. Schlagwort mehr Privat, weniger Staat. Ich glaube, mehr brauche ich angesichts der fortgesetzten Debatten dazu nicht sagen. Wir werden hier sozusagen wesentlich zum Gegenstand der Auseinandersetzungen. Und das stellt natürlich für die marxistischen Auseinandersetzungen zum Beispiel um Staat und Politik ein wesentliches, wesentliches Problem dar. Und Bob ist ja einer von denen, zusammen mit einer Reihe anderer Theoretiker und Wissenschaftlerinnen, die sich damit auseinandergesetzt haben. Nämlich auch, weil dadurch die Bedingungen jetzt für progressive Politik natürlich massiv verändert werden. Und das heißt, die zentrale Frage ist sozusagen immer dann auch gewesen für die marxistischen Debatten, was passiert überhaupt in der Krise und im Prozess der Veränderung und was folgt dann möglicherweise nach dem Fordismus? Ist das ein stabiles Entwicklungsmodell, wie man das noch 45 behaupten konnte, oder ist das sozusagen etwas, was weit instabil ist? Für die Entwicklung nach 45 sprach man von Fordismus. Ich gehe da jetzt in dem Detail darauf ein. Der Begriff ursprünglich wurde geprägt von Antonio Gramsci, einem italienischen Marxisten, der in den 30er, 20er, 30er Jahren im faschistischen Kerker in Italien sozusagen einsaß und dort aber dann die berühmten Gefängnishefte schrieb. Und war die Bezugnahme auf diese Veränderungen, die damals in den USA sichtbar wurden, mit in den Fabriken etwa von Henry Ford, mit der spezifischen Technologie, die durchgesetzt wurde, Möglichkeit von Massenproduktion verbunden mit verbesserten Arbeitsbedingungen für die Beschäftigten. Grundsätzlich eben äh, beruhte dieses Modell auf einer Verknüpfung von Massenproduktion und Massenkonsum, auf einem bestimmten Modell des Staates, was das abstützte, also Wohlfahrtsstaat, öffentlicher Sektor und dergleichen Kontrolle der Finanzflüsse, auf der Basis eines, eines Kompromisses zwischen den Organisationen von Lohnarbeit und Kapital, also einem Klassenkompromiss, und einer starken Rolle der Gewerkschaften. So zumindest die Wahrnehmung der Situation bis dahin. Und die Krise sozusagen, die unterschiedlich rasch in den Ländern einsetzt, sozusagen greift genau in diesen Bereichen sozusagen zu und die Versuche, das zu ändern, dann ebenfalls. Ja. Man spricht dann davon oder hat dann festgestellt, dass quasi eine Art Finanzialisierung der ökonomischen Prozesse stattfindet, ein Durchsetzen des Finanzmarktkapitalismus. Bob wird hier einige Dimensionen dann ausführlicher debattieren wo sozusagen auch in den Unternehmen sich sozusagen die, die Zielsetzungen, die Profiterwartungen verändern, verändern, sozusagen die Unternehmen wird stärker auf den Shareholder orientiert sind, dass die Unternehmen permanent zu Umstrukturierungen zwingt, die Privatisierung von öffentlichen Dienstleistungen, sozialen Sicherungssystemen, wird das in Wertsetzung diskutiert, in manchen Ländern sind Pensionsfonds riesige Kapitaleigner, die mit ihren Investitionen natürlich ökonomische Prozesse beeinflussen können. Gerade auch im Bereich jetzt wie Wohnen und so weiter haben wir in vielen Ländern einen kreditgetriebenen Konsum, der ja dann 2008 auch mit für die Krise verantwortlich war, der sozusagen dann deswegen dann bei dieser Durchsetzung des Finanzmarktkapitalismus sich aber sehr krisenhaft erweist, weil ja einerseits sozusagen diese Umstellung auf finanzgetriebene Akkumulation gleichzeitig wiederum verknüpft ist mit einer Veränderung zum Beispiel und Flexibilisierung der Arbeitsverhältnisse, die aber zum Beispiel dann eigentlich solche Kredite bedienen sollten und da gibt es also dann natürlich Probleme, wenn das irgendwann nicht gelingt, wie 2008 ja dann sichtbar wurde. Vielleicht interessant, dass diese Veränderungen, und das ist sozusagen eine, eine Dimension, die dann zeigt, wie das ausgreift, die jetzt nicht nur die Ökonomie oder den Staat erfasst, sondern auch die Lebensweise, die Subjektivierung, die Art, wie Subjekte geformt werden, wo man dann zum Beispiel sieht, wenn man das wieder mit der Ökonomie verbindet, 
dass quasi jetzt nicht nur die Verbesserung der Technologie, wenn der klassischen Annahme der relativen Mehrwertproduktion die Dynamik des Kapitalismus befördert, nachdem bestimmte Grenzen durch den Klassenkampf gesetzt worden sind, sondern dass auch dann also dass sich auch das, die Subjektivität, das Arbeitsvermögen der Menschen zum Beispiel hier dann anpassen soll, dass es eine Diskussion zu Arbeitskraftunternehmen, ich ergehs unternehmerischen Selbst und so weiter gibt, dass die Leute sozusagen hier fähig werden, die Dynamik der Akkumulation wiederherzustellen. Ähm, ja, zum Neoliberalismus äh, ist sozusagen hier gibt es eine der wesentlichen politischen und ideologischen Formierungen in dieser Phase, der sozusagen diese Veränderungsdynamiken vorantreibt. Und ich gehe jetzt da nicht im Detail auf diese Veränderungen ein. Sie kennen die Debatten. Mir scheint wichtig zu sehen, dass es nicht nur auf die Ökonomie, nicht nur auf die Wirtschaftspolitik beschränkt bleibt, sondern es diesen neoliberalen, neokonservativen Modellen und Regierungsprojekten gelingt, verschiedene gesellschaftliche Konfliktlagen miteinander so zu artikulieren, dass ein grundlegender gesellschaftlicher Wandel auf verschiedenen Ebenen möglich wird, was natürlich für die marxistische Analyse dann massive Probleme beschreibt. Und gleichzeitig natürlich auch darauf hindeutet, dass jetzt progressive Auseinandersetzungen diese Vervielfältigung der sozialen Problemlagen und Konflikte ebenfalls aufnehmen müssen, nach 68 das auch aufgenommen haben, aber eben dann die Veränderungen eben sich nicht auf die Ökonomie beschränken können. Abschließend sozusagen dann eben die Frage, wie sozusagen in dieser Konstellation, das ist ja eine der Thematiken, die, die eine marxistisch orientierte Theoriebildung immer wieder angreibt, antreibt, die Frage natürlich, wie sozusagen eine andere Welt möglich wäre, die sozusagen nicht bestimmt ist von der Verwertungslogik. Also ich habe jetzt hier nur Punkte genannt, weil man will Wegweiser, ich würde gar nicht jetzt dann sagen, was das im Einzelnen bedeutet, sondern Dinge, die sich möglicherweise verändert haben durch die Transformationen. Klar ist, dass die Auswirkungen der Produktionsweise und der Lebensweise heute global betrachtet werden, Veränderungen deswegen nicht mehr auf den Nationalstaat beschränkt bleiben können, ökologische Problematik nur ein Schlagwort dazu, dass die Vervielfältigung, die Heterogenisierung von Klassenpositionen im ökonomischen Wandel zum Beispiel klassische Modelle der Organisierung des Industrieproletariats auch überholt haben. Also es gibt Industriearbeiter, Arbeiterinnen, Dienstleistungsbeschäftigte, die Prekariat versus hochqualifizierte Feminisierung der Arbeitswelt, zu einer, also Migrant, Migrantinnen und so weiter. Also es ist weit schwieriger hier natürlich so etwas wie eine einheitliche Organisation zu ermöglichen. Verknüpft sich damit, dass andere Konfliktfelder und gesellschaftliche Bereiche nicht sozusagen hier sekundär betrachtet werden können. Auch hier nur Schlagwörter, Sorgearbeit, Ökologie, Fragen des Antirassismus und so weiter. Das ist jetzt hier nur als Platzhalter da alles gesetzt für die Bandbreite dieser Debatten. Und dann stellt sich natürlich die Frage, sozusagen, wie ist diese Veränderung denkbar? Ist quasi eine Demokratisierung aller Lebensbereiche Schlagwort jenseits staatlicher Kontrolle? Bin gleich fertig. Also was bedeutet das, gerade nach den Erfahrungen mit Staatsverwaltungswirtschaften im real, sogenannten realen Sozialismus, eben keine Verstaatlichung möglicherweise von Produktionsmitteln, sondern solidarisches Wirtschaften und eine Vergesellschaftung. Vorschläge gibt es viele, brauche ich jetzt auch nicht näher ausführen, die sind schwierig herum, aber ich denke, das ist so der Kontext der Problemstellung, mit der sich eine marxistische Analyse, marxistisch orientierte Analyse im Kontext anderer kritischer Debatten äh, mit den Veränderungen der kapitalistischen Produktionsweise und des Staates äh, seit den 70er, 80er Jahren auseinandersetzt. Und Bob Chesop hat in dieser Debatte ja wichtige Beiträge zu diesen Veränderungen auf globaler, internationaler Ebene, aber auch mit in Bezug auf die Durchsetzung äh, zum Beispiel neoliberaler Regierungs- und Hegemonieprojekte, der Veränderung von Akkumulationsstrategien in dem Kontext gemacht und wird uns heute hier, denke ich, einen sehr interessanten Beitrag sind der weiteren Problemstellungen, die sich seit der Krise 2008 und im Kontext der Veränderung seit den 70er Jahren ergeben haben und wie uns hier dann der Rückgriff auf Marx, eine Relektüre, Marxische Überlegungen helfen kann. Danke. Damit übergebe ich jetzt an Bob und wir stellen kurz um auf die Präsentation von Bob, damit hier sozusagen das weitergehen kann. Danke. Okay, so it's over to me, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very sorry that I can't be present. As Fabienne said, I had a cycle accident from which I'm still recovering and stops me traveling too much. 
I've taken as my theme the relevance of Marx to the 21st century, partly because I think that's an important topic, but also because it's something I was asked to address. And we've already heard a little from Roland about some of the ways in which Marx's concepts can be developed to analyze what is historically specific to capitalist development in the advanced capitalist economies in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and onwards to neoliberalism. However, although I'll be touching on those topics, it's not primarily what I want to do. I'm in fact starting from a quotation from Karl Marx about classical political economy, uh, about how the classical political economists knew more about the future than they knew about their present. And that's going to be my theme for the following presentation. And I think you can see the opening slide. Marx knew more about the future than about his present. And one of the things that I learned a long time ago in my Marx reading groups, that Das Kapital is a book, Ein Buch zu studieren, nicht zu lesen. It's not something you read once and understand, but it needs continuing reading, rereading, discussion, reflection. So that my presentation is going to take the following form. I'm going to briefly describe what I understand by Marxism, and many other people will have their own particular interpretations. I'm then going to focus on perhaps the key concept that Marx introduced into the critique of political economy, the capitalist mode of production, and identify just a few themes there that are important for historical and contemporary analysis. Then I'm going to introduce his comment on how the classical political economist knew more about the future, and I'm going to assert and then hope to demonstrate that this is also true for Marx himself. And I'm going to illustrate that from four particular topics. Many more could have been chosen, but I think these are particularly relevant to the understanding of the 21st century. And they are the world market. That's often discussed under the, the rubric of globalization, but that implies that this is something new. And for Marx, the world market was the presupposition of capitalist development and not merely some late result of capitalist development. I'm then going to deal with financialization. Many people argue that Marx did not have a theory of money or credit or financialization. I think that's mistaken. And I'm going to illustrate how one might use Marx for understanding financialization today. Then I'm going to deal with something that Roland has touched upon, what we might mean by post-Fordism. One of the ways to describe that is that what follows Fordism is the Wissensbasierte Wirtschaft, the knowledge-based economy. I'm going to illustrate some of the things that Marx thought about knowledge, production, and so forth, and how that might be developed today. And then I'm going to deal with ecology, ecological crisis, in terms of Marx's analysis of Stoffwechsel, in terms of metabolism. And then, if there's time, I'll be reaching some conclusions. So let me move on now from the outline to my attempt to define, for me, Marxism. So I think, theoretically, Marxism analyzes the technical and social relations of production, their conditions of existence, and their effects on other social relations. That's the core. Obviously, there's a lot more that is to be found in Marx's work. But it's not a complete theory of everything. It's not a total theory. It's a theory of totalization, how the logic of capital accumulation comes to affect many other social relations, but not everything about the social world or the natural world can be found in the work of Marx, and he's often parasitic upon other disciplines 
uh, especially in the natural sciences. And politically, almost nothing can be derived from Marxism as I've described it. It can re be reflected in projects such as liberation and theology or taken to year zero in Cambodia. So I've worked primarily as a plain Marxist who reads Marx, treats Marx as a classic theorist, and by classic theorist I mean somebody who asks very important questions, unsubstitutable, irreplaceable questions, but we're not necessarily happy with the answers that Marx gave, but we need to start with Marx in order to move on. And now moving to my definition of the capitalist mode of production, and this is simply taken out of, distilled from, Marx's four volumes of capital. When I say four, I'm also including theories of surplus value. And the opening statement in Das Kapital, Band 1, is wealth appears, Reichtum appears, as an immense accumulation of commodities. The commodity is his starting point. What's historically specific about capitalism, because commodity production, commodity exchange has existed before, is that the commodity form is generalized to labor power, to Arbeitskraft. That labor power is treated as if it were a commodity. It's not a commodity, but it's treated as if it were a commodity, and that's the historically specific feature of capitalism. In treating Arbeitskraft, labor power, as a commodity, this has a dual significance. Concrete labor, what particular use values are being produced, and labor time, the common denominator of commodities being the socially necessary labor time involved in producing them, and that gives us abstract labor. And again, a unique feature in the context when Marx was writing is that Marx treats capitalist mode of production as a political economy of time. As Henrik Grossman pointed out, we have an enormous number of novel concepts for thinking about the time of production, the time of circulation, and so forth. Uh, a key role for money as a social relation, I'll come to that later, the essential role of competition, vet the verb, and not only at the level of firms, sectors, but also nationale wettbewerbsfähigkeit and the contribution to that of the state and civil society in securing the conditions for valorization and wettbewerbsfähigkeit, which gives you the idea from Joachim Hirsch of the nationale wettbewerbsstaat. Moving on again to the next slide, this is my quotation from Marx in 1847. All those laws developed in the classical works on political economy are strictly true only on the assumption that trade is delivered from all fetters, that competition be perfectly free, not only a single country, but upon the whole earth. These laws, which Smith Say and Ricardo developed, the laws under which wealth is produced and distributed, these laws grow truer, more exact, less abstract to the extent that free trade occurs. Thus it can be said that the economists know more about society as it will be than society as it is. They know more about the future than the present. And I think that's a statement we can also apply to Marx. He knew more about the future than he did about his present. He was writing in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s about a world in which the capitalist mode of production had not yet established its dominance, not even within individual national economies, let alone on a world 
scale. And in that sense, his power of abstraction anticipates future developments in a very clear way. And what I want to do is to illustrate that argument in relation to four themes. Um, and how is it possible that he anticipates the future, knows more about the future than he does about his present because of the particular approach that he eventually developed in Das Kapital. He begins that work in the foreword to the 1867 edition with an argument that uh, every beginning is difficult, holds in all um, sciences. Jeder Anfang ist schwer. And he eventually decides he's going to follow the method of cell biology, drilling down, looking at the most elementary unit of the capitalist mode of production, which is the commodity, which he describes as the economic cell form, ökonomische Zellen form of the capitalist mode of production. And he says, I'm going to follow the method of the natural sciences, but I can't do experiments. So I have to use the power of abstraction. But that's not purely logical. He says, just as physicists look at natural processes where they have the most pregnant, the most pure form, free from disturbing influences, or where they can't make exper experiments, look at the purest development of the process. So he's applying the power of abstraction in relation to the most pregnant, the most pure form of the capitalist mode of production, and that is England. But he also says, de te fabula narrata. Don't worry, Germans reading Das Kapital, that this book is only about England. I'm looking at England as the most pure form. And later he will go on and look at the United States and other more contemporary examples to try to distill the developmental logic, the developmental tendencies of the pure capitalist mode of production. Now I'm moving to the next slide, and that begins with the world market. Marx argues, this is in the Grundrisse, the Rohentwurf, for capital, the most developed mode of existence of the integration of abstract labor, that's to say the specifically capitalist form of labor power, with the value form is the world market, a place in which production is posited as a totality together with all its moments, but within which at the same time all contradictions come into play. Remember when Marx is writing this, 1858, the world market is far from fully developed. He is predicting the further development of the world market, the increasing integration of the world market, and the increasing globalization, if you like, of the contradictions of capital. Moving on again, next slide. The world market is directly given in the concept of capital itself. It's not some accidental historical product that could or could not develop. The logic of capital accumulation is its expansion on a world scale. Capitalist production is unthinkable without foreign trade. It's consolidated by the rise of big industry, machine factor etc. Indeed, the Fordist model later. And the effective operation of the world market requires the full development of the credit system. These are logical presuppositions for the development of the world market, but also, if you like, predictions about the historical development of the world market. Increasing foreign trade, increasing concentration of capital in big industry, the increasing importance of the capitalist credit system. Moving on again, a wonderful quotation. Again, see how early this is. This is before Das Kapital, 
This is from the Deutsche Ideologie. The movement of capital, though much accelerated, still remained, however, relatively slow. The splitting up of the world market into separate parts, each of which was exploited by a particular nation, the exclusion of competition among themselves on the part of the nations, the clumsiness of production itself, and the fact that finance was only evolving from its early stages, greatly impeded circulation. Again, what you're seeing here is a reflection not on the historical conditions in 1845 to 46, although it is that, you're also seeing a set of arguments about the world market will be more integrated if we can overcome the division of the world market into separate parts, if we can inc intensify competition, if production becomes more smoothly integrated, if finance becomes global and so forth. Next slide. And this brings us what is the relevance of Marx's analysis of the world market as presupposition of capital accumulation to the present time. And my argument here is that we can see neoliberalism as a project of world market completion. If we take the various elements that Marx identifies as logically implied in capital accumulation as necessary preconditions for the full development of the world market, neoliberalism can be interpreted as a project to complete the world market. What's important is that it's not the spontaneous operation of market forces alone, but also the result of class struggle. And regardless of the type, and there are many varieties of neoliberalism, neoliberalism generalizes and intensifies the contradictions of the capital relation globally. Neoliberalism creates the conditions for the first truly global economic and financial and political crises. And not only that, the logic of neoliberalism intensifying those contradictions is to colonize other systems and the life world by imposing profit-oriented, market-mediated capital accumulation on them. We see that in the universities, we see it in the Gesundheitssystem and elsewhere, and it is continually destabilizing the conditions for stable economic growth, increasing and intensifying contradictions of capital. So I'm now finished on the world market and neoliberalism. We'll move on to my second relevance of Marx to the 21st century, which is money as a social relation. It's tempting in everyday language to describe money as a thing. But it's actually a social relation, and that's how Marx describes it. It's a fetishized social relation. Money is both a commodity, but also a fetishized, a fictitious commodity, and not a single social relation, but a complex, contradictory ensemble of social relations. And Marx is very clear as he develops his analysis in Capital Volume 1 that we need to consider money both as money as money, but also money as capital. And the, the logic of Volume 1 is to get us from the necessity of money in commodity circulation to the role of money as capital in organizing the circuit of capital, facilitating, mediating accumulation. And Marx provides, in fact, a very sophisticated analysis of the functions of money, the hierarchy of money forms, and the tension between national currency and world money. We see that played out still today between the United States dollar, the euro, and the increasing importance of the Chinese currency, the renminbi. And these are sites of contestation, not only in the 19th century, 
the 20th century, but today as well. To illustrate the idea of money as a social relation, referring to Roland's discussion of Fordism, we have the idea that the Fordist class compromise implies that to make the poor work harder, you link pay to productivity, and to make the rich work harder, you link industry and unions. And this is the classic Fordist compromise that rising wages fuel rising consumption, which fuels profits, which fuels investment, and so forth. That's an argument that Gerhard Schmidt uh, made very clearly in Germany in the 1970s. And we can contrast that with neoliberalism, which you may be familiar with. To make the rich work harder, you pay them more. To make the poor work harder, you pay them less. That's the neoliberal logic of how one employs money as a social relation to embed a certain set of forms of class domination in the social relation. So that's a little bit of light relief. And now we move on. Uh, I'm not going to deal with this in detail. I've already said to the organizers that anybody who wants can have my PowerPoint slides. So I won't discuss this in detail. This is just a presentation of Marx's account of the different functions of money and the ways in which each of those functions of money is related to a specific set of crisis tendencies. One of the most interesting points about Marx's work is that every social relation is the site of contradictions and a source of crisis tendencies. Uh, it's often said that for neoclassical economics, capitalism is eternal and crises are accidental. Whereas for Marx, capitalism is historically specific and crises are imminent possibilities within the logic of capital. So when we're looking at Marx's work, we're not just looking at an account of capitalism, and then I wonder what he says about crisis. When Marx analyzes the capitalist mode of production, he's also continually concerned with the possibilities of crisis. To illustrate that, he argues not only that there are industrial crises, but in uh, theories of surplus value and in Capital Three he analyzes the specific mechanisms of monetary crisis. In times of pressure, when credit contracts or dries up, money suddenly confronts commodities absolutely as the only means of payment, the true existence of value. Hence the general devaluation of commodities and the difficulty, even impossibility, of transforming them into money. Millions worth of commodities must be sacrificed for a few millions in money. The dash for liquidity. As long as the social character of labor appears as the monetary existence of the commodity and hence as a thing outside actual production, monetary crises, independent of real crises, that is to say independent of crises within the circuits of productive capital, or as an intensification of them, are unavoidable. And my argument is, and this has been made by many others, that the increasing importance of capitalist credit relations, the increasing importance of financialization, creates the possibilities of ever more significant and ever more global financial crises, unrelated uh, in significant ways unrelated to crises in the profit-producing sector. And this is related to uh, the role of banks. Uh, a famous bank robber was one asked, one asked, why do you rob banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. And one might look at 
the, the role of banks themselves as predatory and not merely as facilitating capital accumulation. So give a man a gun and he can rob a bank, give a man a bank and he can rob the world. And this is part of Marx's analysis, the predatory character and not merely the facilitating or supportive character of banks. So Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. But now, in an interesting twist, we see this in the North Atlantic financial crisis and elsewhere, banks, individual banks, rob the central banks because that's where the credit is that will rescue them from their financial difficulties. And an important mechanism in that regard is derivatives, is derivatum, and I'll come back to that later. So money as money, and then money as capital. This is J.P. Morgan, one of the famous robber baron bankers, uh, money as capital. And this brings me from money to the notion of financialization before I go on to consider um, Stoffwechsel and metabolism. So, how might one describe financialization? There are some very obvious indicators that have been widely discussed in the literature, including in everyday uh, literature as well, uh, like Handel's Blatt, the proliferation and expansion of financial markets the deregulation of financial systems and the broader economy, new financial instruments, I've mentioned Deddy Barton and many others, the dominance of finance over profit-producing capital, so increasingly short-term financial considerations affect the ways in which industrial or commercial capital operate, that market forces complemented or reinforced by state policies underpin rising inequalities in income and wealth. Consumption tends to be sustained by extending credit and finance colonizes economic and social reproduction and then a special accounting culture. So that's at a descriptive level. Um, we try to put that into more systematic terms the basic principle is the transformation of future streams of income, whether profit, dividend, interest, or even intellectual property rights, into a tradable asset. It's a pattern of accumulation in which profit making occurs increasingly through financial channels, not through trade and commodity production, and it reflects the systematic power of finance within the economy and more broadly. And now I want to mention derivatives and take us back to the German ideology. If you remember Marx and Engels's comment on why the world market in 1845-46, when they wrote the German ideology texts, was not well developed. And we can see derivatives, financial derivatives, as a form of market completion. They overcome the frictions of national boundaries. They open national economies to foreign competition. They help to overcome the clumsiness of production, originally in agriculture, now universally. And they enhance the role of finance in promoting competition. And we know, Marx predicts it, that the greater the integration of the world market, the more the contradictions of capital accumulation are generalized, the more intense those contradictions become, and the more global is the form of crises. And I think if we were to apply some of Marx's insights to the development of the world market, of monetary relations, credit relations, and financialization, we can see the significance of those remarks 150 years ago to capital accumulation in the 21st century. Uh, now I'm going to deal with the knowledge-based economy, 
and again go back to Marx, most of the comments on knowledge, science and general intellect are in the Grundrisse, but we find them in other texts as well. And in fact, they wrote a great deal on knowledge, science, and intellectual property, but they didn't write very much as such on industrial or intellectual property. But I will be arguing that we can find the clues in Weiser to this discussion in Marx. They treat science as a collective endeavor and a universal productive force. They compare it to a free gift of nature, traditional knowledge, shared knowledge, the intellectual commons are available for, as an input, in many different kinds of production process. They also note that as machinofacture developed, no longer the skilled craftsman, uh, but the organization of big industry, science is separated from production. Indeed, they argue it can even become a business. Some firms, some sectors specializing in producing knowledge and then selling it to other firms. And there are also interesting comments in Marx on product development cycles. And this is very relevant to a well-known question posed today how much does the latest version of Microsoft's Office software cost? And the answer is either billions of dollars or a few euro cents. Depends whether it's the first copy or the one that you download from the web. And Marx is aware that this is a phenomenon early on in the sorry in the 19th century, where intellectual property may be an important factor in helping to preserve um, in, uh, profitability. So these are some general comments that he makes. Capital is obliged to seek to increase productivity. Productivity advances are based on the general intellect. The more social agents enjoy free time for creative learning, the more the general intellect will flourish. But capital reduces the necessary labor time to increase surplus labor time, it doesn't, it's not interested in increasing free time, allowing the general intellect to flourish. And that creates a, con a contradiction between creativity in civil society and the profitability of private business and increasing social irrationality. Which brings me to the idea of Wissensbasierte Wirtschaft as a form, one form of post-Fordism, and this is the knowledge-based economy, it involves the production, management, distribution, and use of knowledge as a key driver of growth, wealth generation, and job creation. It's applied reflexively, and this is the difference with the 19th century, reflexively to the production of knowledge, so increasing thinking about how we can apply knowledge within the economy, what kinds of new knowledge do we develop, and so forth. And drawing on Marx's analysis, we could see some of the important mechanisms. Yes, I'm fine. I've, I've got my stopwatch running, and I'm at 33 minutes at the moment, so I will finish in 40. Um, the mechanisms include the appropriation of collectively produced knowledge of past generations, what Vandana Shiva calls biopiracy, the formal subsumption of knowledge production under capitalist logic, the development of expert systems, and in the Hollywood sector, why we need to defend our intellectual property because we're creative, the creative workers themselves are employed for hire. They're not, they don't get the benefit of their creativity. That goes to the firm that employs them. I'm going to Skip that slide in the interest of getting to my the end in 40 minutes, but these are various ways in which you can apply Marx's insights in capital to the specific form of intellectual property, its legitimation, how it operates. Now this is my fourth theme, Stoffwechsel, metabolic drift. Marx and Engels read natural sciences avidly. 
Stoffwechsel first developed as a concept in cell biology and then was developed in physics, in mechanics, thermodynamics, uh, land economy, and so forth. And it was a key theme in Marx's analysis of capital, the nature of metabolism, and particularly the interrelationship between capital and the physical environment. And we know not when Marx was writing, perhaps, although he was very concerned with what he called the metabolic drift, the increasing pollution of the environment, the increasing speed with which natural resources were being used, but this is obviously in the 21st century even more important. I take this slide from Elmer Altfarte, and I'd like just to take the opportunity to express my regret that he died on the, the 1st of May this year. He was one of the most interesting commentators on metabolism and capitalism and identifies a number of different meanings of the Green New Deal as a major theme in contemporary capitalism, contemporary politics, and pointing out that a lot of the discussion of the Green New Deal is merely political rhetoric which disguises a continuing commitment to capital accumulation based on the exploitation of resources in unsustainable ways. And while there's a lot of talk about the Green New Deal, I think that its biggest risk is that every time it gets put onto the economic and political agenda, it gets captured by neoliberalism. And what we're seeing is continually the recolonization of green initiatives to serve the interests of profit-oriented, market-mediated accumulation. And one of the latest examples of that is the attempt to commodify nature's services in various ways, uh, commodifying, privatizing nature, to create a new world green economy, but operating in the shadow of capital. Finance-dominated accumulation, I'll skip this very quickly, the categories for the analysis of capital, just to pick out capital as property, and then fictitious capital, Money and derivatives I dealt with in terms of the way in which they help to complete the market economy. But what I want to show is that Marx's analysis of the functions of capital are associated in interesting ways. Each has also its particular set of derivatives. And I've dealt with this already. This is just a repeat of the slide. Overcomes the frictions of national boundaries open national economies to competition, overcomes the clumsiness of production, enhances the role of finance, completes the world market. One of the reasons why we should still be reading Marx today is he didn't actually finish Das Kapital. Three books were missing on the state, foreign trade, the world market, and crisis. And these are, in fact, increasingly important themes in the 21st century. The reorganization of the state on a global scale, new forms of governance, obviously the forms of foreign trade, and we cannot ignore world market and crisis. And now I've skipped over one slide, and I'm coming back to my starting point, which is Marx's Lectura, I read your great book in my capital reading group. As we know, Marx didn't finish capital, so Marx's response to this young, eager student in his Marx lectura group, I read your great book in my capital reading group, is really, how does it end? And that's where I'm going to leave you, because Marx for the 21st century is not a complete and finished text that we can take from 1867, the 1870s, or 1883. It's a text that was never finished, could not have been finished because capitalism continues to develop, but what Marx is providing us with 
is an incredibly important, productive, powerful set of concepts for thinking about the nature of capitalist production in general, but also, say, are inviting us to think how we can take his categories and develop them in different ways. And I've tried to do that with the world market, with money as a social relation, capitalist credit, with financialization, with the knowledge-based economy, and finally with Stockwechsel and the environmental crisis. And I finished 10 seconds early, unusually for me. Over to you, Fabienne or Roland or whoever is the uh, compere for today. Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, vielen Dank für die breite äh, und trotzdem tiefe Einführung in Marx und wie man Marx im 21. Jahrhundert anwenden kann. Gibt es Fragen an äh, Bob Jessop oder gegebenenfalls auch Roland Atzmüller? Um, can we collect some questions, Bob, or do you want to answer each, each uh, no, question? No, I'll collect them. I've got a pen and paper here. I'll make a note because often the questions overlap so I can answer two or three together. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I want you to ask three very connected, connected questions in one question. Uh, first, uh, do you think that the main contra contradiction uh, today is the contradiction of con conditions of production and produ productive forces. Uh, second, do you think that the main problem uh, today is the greater decline of the rate of profit? And third, do you think that the main development today is the increasing importance of rent uh, in relation to the declining surplus w value uh, because of the uh, increasing importance of uh, knowledge-based economy. You know, such uh, uh, um, organizations like uh, Google or Microsoft and so on. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Right. I have another question from Roland, if I saw it. No? Okay. Noch weitere Fragen und auch gerne auf Deutsch fragen. Ähm, ich halte nur automatisch um, weil, wie gesagt, normalerweise ähm, Bob hat nicht durch Zufall sehr viele deutsche Texte auch zitiert reden und äh, also lesen und verstehen funktioniert eigentlich ganz gut. Ja, es gibt überhaupt kein Problem, dass Fragen aus Deutsch <lacht> gestellt werden. Also man merkt, ich habe nicht gelogen <lacht> und Roland auch nicht. Ansonsten würde ich dich bitten. Wir haben noch eine weitere Frage. Ähm, meine Frage ist, ähm, was die Konklusion aus dem äh, vorangegangenen ist mir jetzt nicht genau klar geworden am Ende. Also Sie haben davon gesprochen, dass es eine Konklusio gibt, wie man Marx sozusagen im 21. Jahrhundert lesen kann, aber dass es sozusagen nach Fukuyama mit der Durchsetzung des liberalen marktdemokratischen Modells sozusagen kein, ein, ein, keine, kein Ende gibt, das ist irgendwie, also das wird ja angenommen auch. Ich habe das nicht akustisch verstanden. Könnten Sie das noch einmal äh, darstellen, bitte? Okay. In English maybe? Is it, is it better in English? Okay, my question is, you, you talked about the conclusions that you will draw at the end of um, your uh, lecture. Uh, and I'm asking you, I, don't, uh, I have not seen some, some of the conclusions at the end. Uh, I didn't get to the conclusions because okay. I ran out of time. So okay, so, so, so <laughs> my question is, can you, like, in short, present some of the conclusions that we can draw the from your lecture? The that was the question, the incomplete basically. incomplete Jessup. Uh, I can tell you what the conclusions are now that you've just given me the opportunity to, to so, do so. Yes, please, <laughs> I give okay, you the opportunity right. then. No, I was very sensitive. I, I was given 40 minutes, so at 40 minutes I stopped. And I thought these two slides were appropriate conclusions. 
uh, I think I also did make the conclusion, but let me answer the, the first three questions and then I'll get to the more general conclusions. The first was whether or not the principal contradiction in capitalism is the conflict between the increasing socialization of the forces of production and the continuing private appropriation of profit. This is actually a more general argument that Marx puts forward. You find it in the 1859 preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy. And it's an argument that Marx applies more generally, almost as a philosophy of history, to the succession of modes of production. That each mode of production develops the forces of production up to a point where the forces of production become a fetter on the further development of the social relations of production. And as a, a general principle, as a general heuristic, that's quite an interesting argument. But you can't do very much with it unless you then specify what are the particular productive forces that we're talking about, what are the particular technical and social relations of production. If you remember my general definition of Marxism, it was the analysis of the technical and social relations of production and productive forces, their conditions of existence and their effects. So to make this general contradiction work, uh, which is the idea that it is the general contradiction, is an important part of the sort of Marxist-Leninist Lehrbuch tradition. To make that work, you need a much more detailed, a much more elaborate, a much more complex analysis of what are the productive forces and what are the production relations. And Roland Axmuller, in his presentation, talked a little bit about Fordism and post-Fordism. And what we can see is that while the idea that there is a contradiction between the productive forces and productive relations might be a, a useful organizing principle, that contradiction emerges in many different ways and in many different forms in the logic of capitalist development. So we start with uh, steam power, we move on to electric power, we move on to information communication technologies, the productive forces change, the relations of production change, and there are many possibilities inside capitalism for renewal through what Schumpeter calls creative destruction. So whilst I have no objections to looking at the contradiction between the productive forces and productive relations, it's something that has to be looked at as mechanisms internal to the capitalist mode of production as coming up against a limit and then transcending the limits by finding new productive forces, new relations of production, new sites of exploitation and so forth. So an interesting heuristic principle, but not one that enables us to predict the overthrow of capitalism, but perhaps to find new sites for capital's renewal. In that sense, if I wanted to find a fundamental contradiction, it would be, in the words of Kayuto Saito's book that I put up on one of my slides, it's Natur gegen Kapital, or Kapital gegen Natur. I think the ultimate limit is going to be one to do with the environmental limits of capital accumulation and not things internal to the logic of capital accumulation. The second question was about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And I think there certainly is such a tendency. However, volume three of Capital was written before volume one of Capital. The notes that we have that 
Engels put into Capital Volume 3 predate Marx's final work on Volume 1. And it's not clear to me that the tendency of the rate of profit to fall would have been emphasized as much as it is in Volume 3 if Marx had had the opportunity to revise that in the way that he did Volume 1. So just to repeat the point, um, it's something Marxologists know, but not everybody knows, but Volume 3 was written before the final versions of Volume 1. I accept that there is a tendency of the rate of profit to fall. What I don't accept is that is the, the master tendency or the most important law that governs the development of capital accumulation. And I'm particularly opposed to any attempt to say that any crisis that develops within capitalism anywhere can be related ultimately back of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And I think that's partly why I don't like that argument, is that we know that Marx's work is incomplete, that there are three books that he didn't finish, the one on the state, the one on foreign trade, the one on world market and crises. And I'm convinced myself that his analysis of crisis tendencies would have been fundamentally altered by much more substantial, much more extensive work on the state, much more extensive work on the dynamics of foreign trade and the ways that this provides to overcome crisis tendencies. And above all, we would have learned a lot more about the nature of the world market dynamic of crises. So I'm not saying there is not a tendency of the rate of profit to fall. What I am saying is we should not take that as the master key to the analysis. And we already saw that in one of the slides that I presented, the difference between monetary crises and real crises and the increasing importance of financialization. And then the third question was about the relationship between surplus value and the knowledge-based economy. I wouldn't put it in those terms. I think Wissensbasierte Wirtschaft is just one particular strategy pursued by some fractions of capital. But I do like the work of the Italian operaists and others building on the Grundrisse and on hints elsewhere in Marx's work that the more important science and knowledge and general intellect are to capital accumulation, the more that capital accumulation runs up against, is fettered by its attempt to monopolize knowledge, to subject it to intellectual property rights, and so forth. And I think particularly given what for me at the moment is the fundamental contradiction in the capital relation, as I said, Saito's capital gegen natur, then the blocking of all of those forms of knowledge production, the sharing of knowledge to do with how we overcome environmental crisis how we overcome the metabolic drift. That's where the contradiction is, not surplus value versus knowledge-based economy, but the logic of capital accumulation, which wants to privatize knowledge, turn all knowledge into sources of intellectual property, right, revenues, royalties, licenses, copyright, and so forth. So I would be happy to rephrase that and it would be an interesting illustration of the contradiction between the growing socialization of the forces of production here general intellect and the increasing private appropriation of profit from the application of knowledge science creativity in production now as to those conclusions 
my conclusions are, going back to my quotation of Marx on the classical political economists, that Marx knew more about the future than he knew about his present. That's not because he theorized free trade. That's his argument for the classical political economists. They were advocates of free trade. Free trade did not exist in 1847, but if free trade were further developed, then the arguments of the classical political economists would become truer. My argument is not that Marx advocated free trade, but through the power of abstraction, through the analysis of the logical and historical implications of the commodity form, the value form, the implications of money as money and money as capital, the dynamic of competition, the dual nature of labor power and so forth. In other words, the features that I identified as important in the capitalist mode of production. Thinking through their logic, he was able to anticipate developments, that if the laws of capital accumulation work in the way they do, we will see an increasing integration of the world market. We will see an increasing generalization of the contradictions of capital. We will see increasingly global crises. We will see an increasing importance of money as capital dominating the circuits of capital. We will see an increasing importance of credit relations and fictitious credit relations and fictitious profits. He anticipated the rise of derivatum. He anticipated the metabolic drift and so forth. And so, if you like, my conclusions are, if we follow Marx's method, which is less and less Hegelian, and more and more modeled on the natural sciences, Marx's argument with Engels in the German ideology that there is only one science, and the science is that of history, the history of the co-development of nature and humanity, we can see that Marx is providing us with ways of thinking methods of analysis, productive concepts for thinking about the increasing co-evolution of nature and humankind, of humankind's impact on nature, and of the crisis tendencies that result from that. So that would be the, the general set of conclusions. And it goes back to my very last slide. I don't know if it's still up. I read your great book in my capital reading group. Oh, really, how does it end? Marx didn't finish it. Even if he had finished it in 1883, which is the year in which he died, it would still be necessary to update in the light of further developments in the forces of production, the relations of production, the integration of the world market, and so forth. So um, my opening slide was also one that dwelt on this theme, Marx Lectura Gruppen, ein Buch zu studieren, nicht zu lesen. So I'm urging you at the end of this seminar series on Marx at the Volkshochschule, that there is no substitute for returning to the work of Marx and studying it, but not saying, I only need to read Marx. In many later day Marxists, up to some of the most innovative Marxist theorists today, are drawing on Marx's work and offering solutions, insights into the 21st century. So that may be a good point to conclude, or it may stimulate one or two more questions. I'm in your hands, Fabienne. Uh, 
the, uh, the public wants to thank you for the very interesting answers you gave. There okay. was a word from the back of the room. Are there further questions? Thank you. Uh, Bob, Sie haben gerade referiert, was uh, Karl Marx uh, alles antizipiert hat und in welchen Bereichen er mehr über die Zukunft denn über die eigene Gegenwart uh, zu sagen hat. Ich denke, was Marx nicht antizipiert hat, war die sich äh, beschleunigende globale ökologische äh, Krisensituation, in der wir uns äh, jetzt äh, befinden. Äh, meine Frage, was können wir von Marx lernen, wenn es darum geht, Antworten darauf zu finden, wie diese krisenhafte ökologische Situation äh, in irgendeiner Art und Weise äh, in den Griff äh, bekommen wird. Äh, Kommen werden kann. Also, how to cope with the, with the ongoing and accelerating uh, ecological crisis? Do we have any answers in Karl Marx on that? I'm afraid that Marx gives us no answers to that. Uh, he gives us very few good answers in terms of political strategy more generally, and I think that's where Marx does need to be updated for the 21st century because all of his political recommendations were being developed at a time when liberal bourgeois democracy was still developing, where the state had a much more oppressive face. And you find in the 1880s, even more in the 1890s, in Engels, interesting discussions about the possibilities of democratic transitions and forms of political mobilization that didn't rely merely on the political party form. So this is one of the areas where I'm afraid we have to think for ourselves rather than return to Marx for some sort of answer. And I really do wish I knew the answer because it is, I think, the fundamental contradiction that's confronting us today And this is not something that I have worked on a great deal. I have to defer to some of your colleagues uh, in Austria who are working on these topics, whether they're Austrian or German, uh, less important, Ulrich Brandt, Christoph Gerg, the late Elmer Altvater, and of course many of the, the green movements and so forth that are active. So we can't just think that the answer to everything, especially the answer to political questions, is to be found in Marx. This is one of the things that his analysis of a capitalist mode of production is not able to furnish us the necessary tools for thinking about. So we, we can study the source of the problems in Marx. We won't find the answer to the problems in terms of political action in Marx. There I would fast forward to some of my favorite theorists, Antonio Gramsci, Nikos Poulanzas, and some of the, the more recent ecological theorists who are working a very good and strong Marxist tradition. So I hope that's not a disappointing conclusion to an otherwise positive um, presentation on Marx, but this is not something you'll get the answer by rereading Capital or the preparatory works. This is something we must work out for ourselves in contemporary 21st century conditions. Gibt es weitere Fragen? Wenn dem nicht so ist, nochmal vielen Dank, Bob, für den sehr interessanten Vortrag und äh, die sehr interessanten Antworten. Ich glaube, ähm, dass wir alle heute etwas mitnehmen konnten für das, wie wir Marx im 21. Jahrhundert anwenden können, was bei Marx vielleicht auch fehlt, weil es ist ganz klar, man kann kein komplettes Werk über alles schreiben. Das hast du ja eingangs auch schon ähm, auf deiner Folie erklärt und auch verbal vorgebracht im Vortrag. Aber dass wir uns quasi nochmal mit den Methoden und den Perspektiven von Marx heute auseinandersetzen können und sehr, sehr viel bei ihm schon über die heutigen Entwicklungen im Kapitalismus und die Gesetzmäßigkeiten ähm, finden können. Also nochmal vielen, vielen Dank, dass du die Zeit genommen hast für die Einführung und für diesen interessanten Vortrag. Okay.
Thank you. And I think I've seen Christian in the audience. So I just yes. wave to Christian. Hi. Yep. Good. You saw her. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Brigitte right. isn't so in the picture. She's, she's there too. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Vielen Dank nochmal. Und ähm, wie eingangs erwähnt, äh, ist der nächste Vortrag äh, in der Reihe am 20. Mhm. Juni an der JKU um 12 Uhr. Es ist quasi eine Mittagsvorlesung für diejenigen, die vielleicht Zeit hätten im Kepler-Gebäude. Informationen können Sie und ihr sowohl den Plakaten, die aushängen, ähm, entnehmen, als auch ähm, der Facebook-Seite von unserem Soziologie-Institut. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen und äh, einen schönen Abend. Und natürlich nochmal eine Broschürenwerbung. Falls Interesse besteht, liegen Sie dort vorne.